Around the turn of the 20th century, French artist Paul Cézanne painted a series of watercolor and oil paintings of the French mountain Matagna Sainte Victoire and the surrounding environment. Over the course of more than three decades, Cézanne painted about 30 paintings of this mountain. In these paintings, Cézanne tried to capture different aspects of nature and convey a sense of the heart of the landscape around him. Rather than focusing on surface level details, he used geometry and color to provide a feel for the landscape, attempting to evoke emotions in the viewer of his work that he felt were associated with the landscape. However, one painting of this mountain didn't seem to be enough, and Cézanne obsessed over this mountain landscape and had to paint it over and over again from different vantage points, trying to capture different perspectives and light conditions each time in hopes that the new painting would provide insight into another facet of the mountain's meaning or character. Whether Cézanne accomplished this or not, certainly we can all agree that painting the Matagna Sainte Victoire was the peak of his career. See, I told you no one would laugh at that. Anyway, I find these multiple attempts by Cézanne intriguing because it's not unlike a phenomenon that we observe in mathematics research. Mathematicians value many things, but when it comes to proving a conjecture and making it a theorem, there are two things that mathematicians seem most interested in. First and foremost, they are interested in showing that the fact is true. It doesn't really matter how dense, complex, or long the proof of that fact is, as long as the proof is correct, the theorem is true. Second, mathematicians also care about what they refer to as the elegance of the proof. Even after a theorem is known to be true, if someone finds a new way to prove that fact that is either more efficient, concise, or particularly clever, mathematicians still want to see that proof. Thus, mathematics research not only includes proofs of new theorems, but also new proofs of old theorems that show an original or clever idea, or yield a new insight into why the theorem is true and perhaps how it connects harmoniously to other branches of mathematics. There's a certain beauty to be found in the way that fact interweaves itself through reality. And just like Paul Cézanne, we often find ourselves returning to an old interesting fact to gain new insight into that fact's character and meaning. You can decide for yourself whether that makes mathematical proofs a form of art or not. Few facts exhibit this aspect of mathematics research as much as the Pythagorean theorem. The Pythagorean theorem states that in the Euclidean geometry of the plane, given a right triangle whose legs have lengths a and b and whose hypotenuse has length c, we have that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. This fact has been known for literally thousands of years, having been discovered at least by the time of the Babylonians around 1900 BCE. Likely several different cultures from India to China to Egypt discovered this fact independently long before the Greek mathematician Pythagoras was born in roughly 570 BCE. The theorem also appears in Euclid's Elements. It gets named for Pythagoras because his proof was the first that was spread throughout the world. Over the centuries, the Pythagorean theorem has been proven time and time again, with each new proof found providing a unique way that this theorem is built into the fabric of Euclidean geometry. In fact, the book The Pythagorean Proposition, published in 1927, collected 370 distinct proofs of the Pythagorean theorem. They were even characterized by the type of perspective or flavor they gave. 109 were algebraic, 255 were geometric, four were quaternionic, and two were dynamical. It was hypothesized at the time that no trigonometric proof could exist since practically all of trigonometry is based on the Pythagorean theorem. But recently, this was shown to be false by the unexpected discovery of pure trigonometric proofs of the Pythagorean theorem by two young women, Calcia Johnson and Nakia Jackson. Each of these proofs provided a new perspective, flavor, or insight into how ubiquitous the Pythagorean theorem is in the anatomy of mathematics. And today on Scholar sauce, we will explore one of these proofs that was found by former president of the USA, James Garfield. Hey, what did the A chord say when it grew up to be a mathematician? Geometry! And if you like that joke, hit that subscribe button. And if you didn't, uh, hit the subscribe button anyway, because we want you to be part of the Scholar Sauce community. All right, let's get back to the video. James Garfield was born in a log cabin in Northern Ohio on November 19, 1831. His father Abram died two years later, leaving his mother Eliza to raise him and his three older living siblings all on her own. They lived in poverty throughout his childhood and James was mocked for it by his peers. This led to a love of reading which he used as an escape. His schooling began in a small schoolhouse near his home. His older sister, Hitty, often had to carry the five-year-old James on her back through the snow to get there. Events like that might have contributed to James' mother Eliza's decision to donate part of her land for the building of a schoolhouse closer to their home. James showed great geometric talent as a young man both in school and in the first jobs he took as a carpenter and later as a canal boy. James was even hired by his carpenter employer to do his accounting. This job gave James extra time to read through his employer's library. So I guess you could say he was keeping the books. That was marginally better. Eventually, James was encouraged to study at the Giaga Seminary in March 1849 by his cousin that he worked for as a canal boy because of James' knowledge across many subjects. According to his journals, while at Giaga, James liked algebra very well, but also thought it was a Herculean task that he was glad to have persevered through. In 1851, James began attending the Western Reserve Eclectic Institute, which is now Hiram College, and took to the study of geometry quite well, studying it on his own and seemingly catching on rather quickly. However, he seemed to have greater interest in subjects like Greek and Latin. In 
fact, in later years, using the fact that he was ambidextrous, he was said to be able to write a sentence in Greek with one hand while simultaneously writing the same sentence in Latin with the other hand. Though apparently there's no real evidence to substantiate this claim. But if it's true, I've got to say that of all the party tricks I've ever heard of people doing, this one seems one of the handier ones. I've got to hire new writers. At the age of 23, James began studying at Williams College, where he continued to make progress in particularly geometrical varieties in math. He recorded in his journal that, My mind seems unusually clear and vigorous in mathematics, and I have considerable hope and faith in the future. He appeared to be well-rounded as a student, and the Williams College president, Mark Hopkins, remarked about Garfield that he had a large general capacity applicable to any subject. There was no pretense of genius or alternation of spasmodic effort, but a satisfactory accomplishment in all directions. Garfield graduated as the salutatorian from Williams College in 1856 and spoke at commencement. From there, Garfield returned to Western Reserve Eclectic Institute, where he served as principal and married Lucretia Rudolph, who had been a fellow student there. She also shared his love of learning and spoke several languages. During this time, Garfield studied law on his own and passed the Ohio Bar Exam in 1861 and became a lawyer. He was also elected to the Ohio State Legislature in 1860. In 1861, the United States erupted into civil war. A fierce abolitionist, Garfield desired to fight for the Union in what he considered a crusade against slavery. He was convinced to remain in the Ohio State Senate until the legislature adjourned, after which he enlisted in the Union Army. Eventually, he became a general in the Union Army before being elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 1862. When the war didn't end by the time he was to take office, Garfield wanted to continue to fight in the Union Army, but upon the recommendation of President Lincoln that what the country was really short on was good congressmen who had knowledge of military military affairs, Garfield resigned his commission and joined the legislature. Garfield served as a member of the House of Representatives until his election to the presidency in 1880. While in Congress, Garfield was a proponent of the use of data and statistics in helping to direct legislation. He argued in front of the Supreme Court once that nothing is more uncertain than the result of any one throw of the dice. Few things are more certain than the result of many throws. When applied to human life, the law of averages exhibits many striking results. I was going to make a joke about averages here, but then I realized it might be considered kind of mean. I'm sorry. Garfield also was apparently fond of participating in recreational mathematics with other members of Congress, which is where he discovered his original proof of the Pythagorean theorem. Garfield presented his proof based on the area formula of trapezoids to Professor Elihu T. Quimby of the Mathematics Department at Dartmouth College following a speech Garfield gave there in March 1876. Professor Quimby remarked that he had never seen the proof before and asked if they could publish it on behalf of Garfield, which he readily agreed to. This proof appeared in the New England Journal of Education in April 1876, a remarkably fast turnaround by today's publication standards. Garfield's proof of the Pythagorean theorem was the following. Consider a right triangle whose legs have length A and B and whose hypotenuse has length C. Lay a copy of that same triangle so that side B of one triangle is on the same line as side A of the other with them sharing a vertex. Connect the remaining two vertices at the ends of the other legs with another segment. This forms a trapezoid with three triangles inside, two copies of our right triangle and one copy of an isosceles right triangle with leg length C. The area of a trapezoid is the average length of the parallel sides times the height of the trapezoid, or the length of the perpendicular line between the two parallel sides. In this case, that's the quantity a plus b over 2 times a plus b, which equals 1 half a squared plus a b plus 1 half b squared. On the other hand, the area of the trapezoid is also the sum of the area of the three triangles, which in this case would be 1 half a b plus another 1 half a b plus 1 half c squared, or simplifying, 1 half c squared plus a b. Setting these equal to each other yields 1 half a squared plus a b plus 1 half b squared equals 1 half c squared plus a b. Subtracting the a b from both sides and multiplying by 2 yields the Pythagorean theorem a squared plus b squared equals c squared. This proof is original in that it uses the area formula of a trapezoid and is remarkably simple, though not obvious. It provides a nice perspective to see the Pythagorean theorem being neatly required by a triangulation of the area of a trapezoid, a truly unexpected place to find that theorem. The publication of this proof marked the only time in American history that a future president contributed any result to mathematics. It is a mark of Garfield's intelligence and ingenuity. It also tells of his appreciation of knowledge in all its forms, and its value to real life even when the fact may not be directly applicable. While the Pythagorean theorem may not be directly applicable to governing a nation, certainly the logical processes that such proofs exercised were. Which, by the way, is the real reason why studying math in school is so important. Not because you'll use those specific math results later, but because it builds logical reasoning and critical thinking skills better than any other subject. 
1880, Garfield was elected president of the United States of America and is the only standing member of the House of Representatives ever to be elected president. He assumed office in March 1881, and during his tenure as president, he directed the refinance of the national debt, nominated a Supreme Court justice, pushed for civil rights and education for all, and encouraged the strengthening of the U.S. Navy. Unfortunately, his presidency was short-lived as he was shot by Charles Guiteau in July of 1881. Guiteau was a disturbed individual who was irritated that Garfield didn't reward his vocal support of his presidential campaign with a position in the French consulate. Due to poor medical practice at the time, Garfield's wound, which was likely non-lethal, became infected. Garfield died of complications due to sepsis over two months after the shooting. The day before his death, he asked his friend Colonel Almond F. Rockwell, do you think my name will have a place in human history? Rockwell responded, yes, a grand one but a grander one in human hearts. Old fellow, you mustn't talk in that way. You have a great work yet to perform. To which Garfield replied, No, my work is done. Garfield died the next day. Well, President James Garfield's name did have a place in history, and I hope that this video is a fitting tribute to his insightful addition to mathematical knowledge. He represented an example of a time in American history where we valued education and intelligence, and didn't vilify science and intellectuals as many in America have lately. It is my hope that his legacy not only includes an elegant math fact, but a tradition of the love of learning and the value of gaining knowledge for the sake of greater understanding, as well as improving the world around us. Thanks for watching this presentation of President Garfield's Proof of the Pythagorean Theorem. If you enjoyed it, give this video a like and subscribe to Scholar Sauce. Personally, I think proofs of the Pythagorean Theorem are the right angle to approach history from, but let me know in the comments if you'd be interested in seeing more math history videos from this channel, and if there's any moment in math history that you'd like to learn more about. In the meantime, check out this video here where I discuss that the Euclidean line isn't always the shortest distance between two points, or this video series here where I tell the story of Euclid's fifth postulate. And we'll see you next time on Scholar Sauce.